but it, it's about scripture that's gotten twisted. Not necessarily intentionally, a lot of times it's unintentional, but it's what people just assume that a passage means, which if you look into it more carefully and put it in context, it, it doesn't mean that at all. Sometimes it means the opposite, all right? We wanted to start off with a bang. It is the passage that I think is the single most misunderstood passage in the Bible. It's the passage I get the most questions about. I've spoken on this about a year and a half ago. I did it as part of a message, but we thought we should go more deeply into it here this morning. And I'm talking about Romans 9. The infamous Romans 9 messes with a lot of people's head, has for since the fourth century. And so we're going to take a close look at that. It has to do with the question, uh, are we free or do we just appear to be free? Are things actually determined? All right. Now, to, to prime the pump, I want to show a little video clip of uh, one of the movies that is my favorite on a theological level. It, it, it's the best theological movie on Providence that I know is out there, which is saying a lot for Hollywood. Uh, it's The Adjustment Bureau. Have you seen The Adjustment Bureau? It's a fantastic show. It's really good. On a lot of levels, it's a great love story. It's a thriller. It's, and theologically, it's very astute. So here is the setup of this, if you haven't seen the movie. This character played by Matt Damon, so you know it's going to be a good movie because Matt Damon's in it. And, uh, and this a character played by Emily Bunt, they fall deeply in love. It's like love at first sight. There's chemistry there. They're destined to be together. They're madly in love. But these agents from the Adjustment Bureau keep showing up and interfere with the relationship. These agents are sort of angelic figures who are there to carry out the will of the chairman, who is God. And their job is to adjust things to keep God's plan on, uh, I, 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 on track. Uh, and apparently it's not God's plan to uh, have this, these two people fall in love. They're supposed to you know, not, not be married. In an earlier version, it turns out, they were to be forever and ever in love. But the, the plan got changed, which already makes me like this movie. Uh, it, there's different versions of this thing. And so the agents have to, uh, are in charge of the ripple effects. Oh, I love this. And the probability functions uh, that happen with every decision people make is just brilliant. But now, Matt Damon is, is, so, is so clever and so fast and so hot that he can outsmart these, these agents. And so he's finding a way to make this relationship happen, even though the agents are trying to make it not happen. And so the, the agents go, they bump it up one higher, and they call in the big gun. His name is Thompson. He's like an archangel, and he gets the job done. He does whatever it takes to keep God's plan on track. So they kidnap Matt Damon, put him in this warehouse, and here is going to meet Thompson, and they have a very interesting discussion about free will. Let's watch it. Hello? Frustrating, isn't it? My name is Thompson. Whatever happened to free will? We actually tried free will before. After taking you from hunting and gathering to the height of the Roman Empire, we stepped back to see how you do on your own. You gave us the Dark Ages for five centuries, until finally we decided we should come back in. The chairman thought that maybe we just needed to do a better job with teaching you how to ride a bike before taking the training wheels off again. So we gave you the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution. For 600 years, we taught you to control your impulses with reason. Then in 1910, we stepped back again. Within 50 years, you'd brought us World War I, the Depression, fascism, the Holocaust, and capped it off by bringing the entire planet to the brink of destruction in the Cuban Missile Crisis. At that point, a decision was taken to step back in again before you did something that even we couldn't fix. You don't have free will, David. You have the appearance of free will. You expect me to believe that? I make decisions every day. You have free will over which toothpaste you use or which beverage to order at lunch, but humanity just isn't mature enough to control the important things. So you handle the important things. Well, the last time I checked, the world's a pretty screwed up place. It's still here. If we'd left things in your hands, it wouldn't be. All right. You gotta go see this movie. I've seen it several times. It's, it's, it's very good. So here's the thing. I ignore the details about you know, the angels leaving us alone for 500 years and all that stuff. Because God never leaves us alone. He's always working. The question is, how does he work? Does he, con does he work by co coercion and control or through influence? The question is, do we have free will or just the appearance of free will? Which leads to the question, what kind of world did God create? Which leads to the question, what kind of God is God? 
Is God a God who just meticulously controls everything? Or is a God a God who takes risks and gives angels and human beings free will? Uh, a lot hangs on this. And what we need to know is that there are many, many, many Christians throughout history, at least since the fourth century up till today, who believe that, in fact, we don't have free will. Not in the sense that we can affect what comes to pass. They say we might be free in the sense that, we can, that we're free if we can do what we want. Nothing hinders us from doing what we want. But God determines what we want. Which to me is the same freedom my dog has. It's free to eat the bowl, if it, the bowl of food if it wants if I don't stop it. But I wouldn't really call that significant freedom. Um, are, are we free to make decisions that impact the way things come to pass? And, and many Christians say, no, God determines everything. Everything's determined by God. And the major passage that is used to buttress this view is Romans 9. So we're going to take a close look at Romans 9. Now, uh, the section we're going to read here, Paul sets this up by first talking about how God chose Jacob over Esau before they were, had yet been born or done anything good or evil. God just chose Jacob over Esau to work through Jacob instead of Esau. Uh, then Paul says this, starting with verse 18. So God has mercy upon whoever he wills, and he hardens the heart of whoever he wills. Think about that. You will say to me then, well, why did he still find fault? For who can resist his will? If God is, is, is hardening me, well, it's not my fault. He's the one who's doing it. But who are you, a man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me thus? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for beauty and another for menial use or derogatory use? Ugly use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath made for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy? The contrast is all important. He's going to show his wrath on the vessels that he makes for destruction in order to uh, highlight the mercy he has on the vessels of mercy. Aren't you glad I didn't destroy you? I could have, but I didn't, and he's all more glorious for that reason. These vessels of mercy which he's prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. What's going on in this passage? Now, in, in this the deterministic way of reading this, and this generally goes under the name of Calvinism, though there are, are Calvinists who wouldn't hold strictly to this view, uh, and there are some who wouldn't identify with Calvinism who, who hold this view that God controls everything. And there are plenty of people who don't think they believe God controls everything, but they really do because when tragedy happens or something, they say, well, you know, God knows what he's doing. God's still on his throne. God, providence writes straight with crooked line. God's timing is always the right timing, and et cetera, et cetera, revealing that they thought God is behind the, 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 the tragedy. Um, and, and this passage is the thing that's used to buttress this. And on the deterministic reading, it simply means this. God has mercy on whoever he wants to have mercy, and they're the folks who get to go to heaven and eternally share in bliss. And God has his wrath on the vessels he makes for destruction, and they're the ones who go to hell. And most of the people who hold this view hold that hell is eternal, conscious, unending, hopeless, exquisite suffering forever and ever, ever. And God makes them for that very reason. And he, he, he makes these two groups, so then he'll turn to the group that he has mercy on and say, no, aren't you glad I didn't do that to you? Praise me for my mercy. And the folks here who are made for destruction might say, well, wait a minute. Why do you blame us? We're just being the way you made us. And God says, shut up your face. <laughs> who are you to reply back to me? I'm the potter, you're the clay. You've got no right to say anything to me. Although if they're saying anything to him, he's the one making them say it to him, so that kind of makes you wonder about things. Also makes you wonder, why does God have to endure with much patience those vessels he's made for destruction? If he just makes them for destruction, why does he have to be patient with it? They're being exactly the way he wanted them to be. But nevertheless, it means that folks, everybody is destined to heaven or hell before they're ever born. And eternity before the world's created, God decided, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you make for mercy, you make for wrath, you have eternal bliss, you have eternal torture. Everyone's destined. In fact, everything in between is destined in this view. Everything is, a, is, a, is a, a perfect expression of God's plan, both the good stuff and the bad stuff, the glorious stuff and the nightmares. So every, every raped child is exactly as God planned it. Every act of genocide, the Holocaust, everyone who ever got gassed in a gas chamber, everyone who ever died in excruciating death and a disease, every baby that was born disfigured, every, every parent that spent the rest of their life in, in a nightmare of wondering what was happening to the child that got kidnapped, all of it is exactly according to plan, and all of it is for God's glory. He creates it all for his glory. Somehow it, it, some of it shows his mercy, and some of it shows his wrath and his power. Now on the surface... You can understand why people come to this conclusion, though it's interesting that no one drew this conclusion for the first three centuries of church history. No one. 
It wasn't until St. Augustine came up with this interpretation that it became very influential, and now it's hard for people to find a different interpretation. But uh, you can see how people come to this conclusion. In fact, I, I came to this conclusion for several years while I was in seminary. I simply couldn't figure out any other way of interpreting Romans 9. God must determine who goes to heaven and who goes to hell and everything in between. It's what scripture teaches. I guess it's what I got to believe. So I get why people, sincere people, come to this conclusion. I even admire them because it's not an easy thing to believe and it shows their, their, their trust in scripture that they'll believe something which is, I find, so unpalatable, but they believe it because they sincerely believe this is what the Bible teaches. What I have never been able to understand is how people enjoy it. Because even when I believed it, I didn't enjoy it. I mean, the folks who hold this view, they, they would say, oh, God's all glorious, he's all beautiful, he, his majesty, he determines all things, and it's all for his glory, even the people who suffer in hell, it's all decreed for his glory, and it's, it's all together lovely and beautiful, and I could never get in on that. Even when I believed it, even when I believed it, it struck me as, frankly, ugly and terrifying. And you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> Or even think that because it might mean that you're not one of God's elect. Maybe you're one of the reprobate, the vessels of wrath. But I, if I was honest with myself and with God, it was ugly. And I couldn't get in the joy of this. Um, you know, I, I, at the time, had two young children. One was just a newborn. And I thought to myself, for all I know, for all I know, those, my precious babies that I love so dearly, are created for the sole purpose of suffering endlessly and hopelessly in exquisite pain for all eternity for the glory of God. And I am supposed to, if I'm one of God's elect, I'm supposed to say, God, you are all the more glorious for having decided to show forth your power and wrath on my two lovely children an eternity ago, before they're ever born. And now I feel bad for having brought them into existence. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm the means by which they're going to suffer forever. How do I say that's beautiful and glorious? I never got that. And then I never got the joy of being one of God's elect either. Yeah, I'm in, but my kids are out. I, it takes away the joy a little bit. Or how do you have this assurance? People would say, talk about this eternal security. I didn't find any security in this. Because for all I know, God has determined, right now I'm a believer, right now I'm one of God's elect, or at least I look like I'm one of God's elect. But how do I know that in 10 years, God hasn't destined me to walk away from the faith, give up on Jesus Christ, and become a total pagan? People do that, you know. And if God's determining everything, they do it because God determined them to do it. And if God determined it for them, how do I know he didn't determine it for me? He makes people look like they're elect, and boom, they, they end up... In fact, St. Augustine once worried about this fellow monk of his, who was a monk up to the age of 74, and then young, ran off with this young nun. And he said, well, I guess he wasn't one of God's elected after all. But man, you go your whole life up to 74 looking like one of God's elected, and then you blow it. And you blew it because God decreed that you would blow it. So how do I know that God hasn't decreed that I'm going to blow it? I have no security at all. There's no security to this. And if that's what's destined for me... Well, there's literally, I mean this literally, there's not a damn thing I can do about it. Because I'm damned. I mean, I, I, what do you do? Okay. So I couldn't get into this. It's all glorious and all wonderful. And that is, I guess, what led me to keep on searching. I was, never was comfortable in this. I had one Calvinist tell me that the reason I don't believe in predestination is because I was predestined not to believe in predestination. <laughs> Which, you know, he says if you were predestined, you would, you would you'd see the beauty of it. You'd see the joy of it. And, okay, okay, well, then why are you arguing with me? <laughs> you know, who can yet find fault? You know, don't blame me. If I'm a heretic, well, then that's, you know, God's fault. He decreed me this way. It's so weird. God decreed you to be this way, but we're going to try to change it. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I, I, I kept on searching on it. I, I was open to other interpretations. It's always good to look for alternative interpretations. And I came to the conclusion that Romans 9, this is what I'm going to share now. Romans 9 not only does not support the deterministic view of God and uh, of, of, of the world, it actually, I am going to argue, teaches the exact opposite. All right? So put on your thinking caps. It's going to get intense and theological, but that's how we like it around here, right? All right, here we go. I'm going to make four points. Number one, as I always say around here, and I'll make this briefly because we preach on this a lot, start and finish with Christ crucified. Whenever you're thinking about God or anything else that has to do with the kingdom, so you start and finish with Christ crucified. Jesus is the central, absolute, unqualifiable revelation of God. He's not one revelation among others. He's the revelation that sums up and completes all others. That's why Hebrews 1 says that, that he is the one and only perfect, he's the radiance of God's glory, which means when God shines, it looks like Jesus. And he's the perfect expression of, or the, the exact representation of God's very essence. All right? He, he, he expresses what God is like all the way down. And so what Jesus reveals is that God is love, as John says in 1 John 4, 8. And love is defined by the cross. This is the perfect expression of the kind of infinitely intense love that God is to the core of his being. 
That's why Paul could say about the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I, 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 I resolved to know nothing other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because if you know Jesus Christ and him crucified, you know all you need to know. This is what God looks like. It says everything we need to know about God, everything we need to, need to know about ourselves. And, uh, and so our job is to let, let the cross define God for us. Uh, and interpret everything else through that lens. Jesus says, all scripture bears witness to me. And so if we're reading it right, it should never contradict what we learn about God in, in Jesus Christ, and especially in the crucified Christ. It should rather point to the crucified Christ. Paul allows uh, the, the cross to redefine everything he knows about God. So he says in 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 1, he says, to those uh, who have a natural mind, the pagans, the cross is foolishness and weakness. But to us, it is the wisdom and the power of God. Verse 18 and verse 24. It is the wisdom and the power of God. Paul sees the cross as the perfect expression of how wise God is, even though it looks foolish, and how powerful God is, even though it looks weak. When God flexes his omnipotent muscle, it looks like him getting crucified for a race of rebels who could deserve it less, out of love for these rebels, in order to redeem these rebels. That's what God's power looks like. Now, this is the opposite of what humans have always attributed to God. The kind of power we've always ascribed to the gods or to the God has always been the power of control because that's the kind of power we lust after. The power to impose your will on others. The, the power to get your way. The power to crush rebellion. And so the gods have always been this super example of, of Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of power. Zeus kind of power. Just bicep power. I get my way. And what Jesus, what we learn about God on the cross is that his power is the opposite. One of the ways you know this is true. Because no human being would come up with this. We know what human beings do when we make God in our own image. It looks like Zeus. Jesus doesn't look like Zeus. It looks the opposite of Zeus. This is a God who lays down his life for his enemies and lets them crucify him out of love for them. And that's his power. This is how God rules. This is how God defeats evil. This is how God wins hearts. Not so, it's not through coercion. It's through the beauty of his influential, humble, servant love towards others. Now, the deterministic reading of Romans 9 is like, is like Zeus' power on steroids. This is the kind of power humans have always ascribed to God, but on steroids, because here God determines every, every, everything. It's coercive power. I get my way. And so if people go to hell, well, that's because I want them to go to hell. If I have my wrath on them, that's because I want to have my wrath on them to show forth my mercy on those vessels of mercy. It's God imposing his will on everything, but that is exactly the opposite of the kind of power we reveal God to be on the cross. And that should already tell us, flag for us, something's off here, something's missing, uh, keep on searching, because all Scripture is supposed to point to Christ, not contradict Christ. So already it should tell us something's off here. This isn't the God we see revealed in Jesus Christ. Secondly, always pay attention to context. Almost all the errors that happen when people misuse Scripture is because they don't read in context, like the one taken, one left behind. The minute you read in context, you see it can't mean the way what's taken to mean throughout evangelicalism. Pay attention to the context. Now, if you look at the context of Romans 9, here's the thing. Ask the question, why is Paul saying what he's saying? Why is he telling us this? What is the point he's trying to make? What's the problem he's trying to solve? Is he, in fact, trying to teach us about how God individually saves or damns people? Is that his point? Well, if you look at the context, that's not at all the point. Go back to the beginning of Romans 9 and you'll find this. Paul starts by expressing his profound grief that his fellow Jews aren't believing in the Messiah. There are some, but the majority are rejecting Christ as the Messiah. And so he's grieving over this. And that raises this question. In the Old Testament, God promised to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He promised to be the God of Israel. But if most of Israel has rejected the Messiah, he's no longer the God of that, those people. So has God broken his promise to be the God of Israel? All right? That is the question that Paul is addressing throughout Romans 9. He begins to answer it in verse 6 when he says this. Even though that most of the Jews have now rejected Christ as the Messiah, it is not as though the word of God had failed, the promise of God to be the God of Israel. For, and now he begins to answer it, not all are descended from Israel, who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, the true Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his descendants. So here's what Paul's going to argue throughout Romans 9. God is faithful in his promise to Israel to be the God of Israel forever, because the true Israel, Paul will argue, has never been about just your ethnicity, as many Jews thought, or your compliance with the law, as other Jews thought. We're, we're God's people because we're Jews, or we're God's people because we keep the law so well, as opposed to those pagans. Paul says, no, the true Israel has always been about those who had the faith of Abraham. Those are the true children of Abraham. Those are the true Israelites. 
And so God is faithful as long as there are people who are simply having faith in his character, trusting in his covenantal promises. Regardless of what ethnicity they, they, they have, regardless of whether they know about the law or not, it's about faith. That's the true Israel. And so Paul later on will talk about the Gentiles being incorporated into the true Israel in chapter 11. We're, we're, we're made honorary Jews, as it were, because we're, we're, we're part, we share the faith of Abraham. And that's what makes us spiritual descendants of Abraham. That's why Paul in Galatians 6 calls the church the true Israel of God. That's the Israel that God's always been offered after. So God is faithful to his promise. And everything Paul says in Romans 9 is said with a view towards that question. God is faithful, and how is he faithful? Well, what is it to be a true Israelite? That's what he's addressing here. And when you read Romans 9 in that light, you'll find it elicits a very different meaning than if you're reading it with the question, who's, how does God save and damn individuals? That's a question we're reading into the passage instead of reading out of the passage. All right? Third thing is this. Whenever you find a challenging portion of Scripture or a complex argument, and you find this in Paul several times, he can get kind of convoluted sometimes, um, it's important to look for places where the author summarizes their own thought, where they draw their own conclusion. Because if you look at how the, the point that they drew from their argument, that will help you understand how they got there through that argument. But if, if the conclusion that they draw from your argument is different from the interpretation you're giving of their argument, it means that you're reading it wrongly. Now, fortunately, in Romans 9, Paul gives us a really good summary of the point he's making throughout that whole chapter. If the Calvinists were right in interpreting this in a deterministic way, we'd think Paul would sum up his thought by saying this. So what shall we say then? God uh, decides he's going to mercy on some. He's going to uh, have his wrath on others. Uh, no one can reply back to him because he's God. And that's the end of the story. Some are saved, some are damned, and God's prerogatives is to determine who those are. That should be the kind of summary we'd expect. But that's not the summary that Paul gives us. Here's what he says, and he sums it all up. He says, what shall we say then? Well, here's the conclusion. The Gentiles, who did not pursue, pursue righteousness, which simply means being rightly related with God, they didn't pursue righteousness, they have attained it. That is, they've attained the righteousness that comes through faith. They trust in God. But Israel, the, the ethnic Israel, who pursued righteousness, which is based on the law, they did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it through faith, but as if it were based on works. This is the point that Paul is making throughout Romans 9. And notice it answers the question that he raised back in, in, in verse 6. Is God faithful? How is he faithful? Yes, he is faithful because the true Israelite is the one who has faith. And surprising to all the Jews is the fact that the Gentiles who are believing in the Messiah, they've attained right relatedness with God because they, they've never thought about basing their stance with God on their ethnicity or on how good they keep the law. They know that they're the ranked sinners. So they come, humbly come to the Messiah and have faith. But those ethnic Jews who are trusting in the law, we're, we're God's people because we're Jews and because we keep the law, well, they find themselves on the outside. And that's why they reject the Messiah is because they don't think they need a Messiah. And, and, and so notice this, Paul summarizes his argument by appealing to the free decisions of people. He doesn't appeal to what God arbitrarily does. He appeals to the free decisions of people. The Gentiles chose to believe through faith. The Jews chose to stand in their ethnicity and their law abides, and therefore they find themselves on the outside. And so any interpretation of Romans 9 that, that undermines free will has got to be wrong because Paul's own summary of his argument emphasizes free will. In fact, if you put it in a broader context of 9 through 11, and it's all one unit, chapters 9, 10, and 11, you'll find Paul emphasizing free will all over the place. He's always talking about choices that people make. In, in 10, he portrays God as frustrated because people are making choices against him. So, for example, in verse 21 of chapter 10, he, he quotes Isaiah 65, where the Lord says, All day long I've stretched out my hands to this disobedient and contrary people. Oh, God's pleading with this disobedient, contrary people. Will you come to me? Have faith in me. Stop trusting in your sacrifices and your, and your law and, and just trust in me and my covenantal promises. He's frustrated. His heart's broken. Now ask the question. How can a God who's frustrated, his heart's broken because people are stubborn and contrary, be the God who determined that the people would be stubborn and contrary? Think about this. Can you imagine God going up there? My people, come to me. Don't be stubborn and contrary. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I'm the one who made you stubborn and contrary. Still, won't you come to me? I want you to come to me. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted you to not come to me. That's why I made you not come to me. But I want you to come to me. We've got a seriously conflicted God here, folks. <laughs> and that his right hand doesn't know what his left hand doeth. <laughs> you know, it's, and you can call that a mystery if you want. 
but you could call it something else if you wanted to. I, 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 to me, any God who is pleading with people to come to him is not a God who's controlling people. Because if he was controlling people, he'd get what he wants. At least in that passage, what he wants is people to come to him. Now, on the reading of Romans 9, he wants half the people or more not to come to him. Good luck putting those two together. Paul emphasizes free will in different ways uh, as well. He says, for example, that the Jews were hardened because of their unbelief. Chapter 11, verse 20, he says that they're broken off because of their unbelief. Now, notice this. He doesn't say, he never says that the reason they don't believe is because they were hardened, which is what the deterministic interpretation of Romans 9 tells us. He hardened them so they wouldn't believe so he could have wrath on them. No, he hardened them because of their unbelief. He didn't cause them to not believe. His hardening wasn't the ground of their unbelief. Rather, he's responding to their choice not to believe by hardening them. Now, the hardening thing, remember, is not about individual salvation or damnation. Don't read that into the passage. In fact, the hardening thing, as we'll see here in a moment, is just God's choice to fashion a, a, a people in a certain direction based on the decisions they make. Given that you're going to be this kind of a person, uh, I, I have to form you in this way. And the hardening isn't about damnation. In fact, if you read Romans 11 carefully, the hardening is done. It expresses God's wrath because it means there's judgment. But even that is done out of love. God does it for the purpose of, with the hope at least, that people will turn to him and will learn the consequences of their decision and will turn to him. And so Paul in Romans 11, he says, yeah, God's hardening the Jews, but he's doing it in order to teach them uh, that it's in their best interest to turn to, towards him. And, and he wants to have mercy on them. In fact, Paul ends Romans 11 by expressing a great confidence that all the Jews in the end are going to come back to the Lord. And we could spend a long time talking about what that means. But here, obviously, Paul doesn't see the hardening as a permanent thing or as a, or as a hateful thing. It's done out of love for the purposes of redemption. In fact, God's judgments are always ultimately for the purpose of redemption. That's the kind of God he is. Okay, so there's emphasis on free will here. Something's off with the deterministic reading when it contradicts everything else Paul says in 9, uh, 10, and 11. Then the, the, the fourth point then is this. Paul talks about this one lump of clay. And that comes from the Old Testament. That's an Old Testament analogy. And so it's so important to look at the context of Old Testament analogies uh, when a New Testament author uses them. Here, in, the, in, in the deterministic reading, they think they know what the one clump is about. It's just a, a dead, mindless lump of clay. And so God unilaterally decides, people on the left, you are my favorite. You will have eternal heaven. People on my right, uh, you will be, suffer exquisite torture forever and ever. And people on my left, aren't you glad that I'm not doing it to you? Praise me for my mercy. Um, and that's what the analogy means. And it's supposed to be good and glorious. Now, if I came downstairs when my son was seven, he's playing with clay figurines, and he's doing this, Worship me because I didn't destroy you the way I destroyed them for being the way that I made them. I would take him to a psychiatrist very quickly, to be frankly, because there's something missing here. There's a moral dimension. It's like my son is really into this. Worship me. I can destroy whoever I want. And it's like, okay, we got to take care of something. But somehow when you attribute that to God, it's supposed to be good and glorious and wonderful and majestic and beautiful. That's the part I, did, I, I, I never could get. But see, if you put that analogy, here's the thing. When New Testament authors use analogies from the Old Testament, don't assume you know what they mean. Go back and look in the Old Testament to see what they mean, because the authors always presuppose that meaning when they apply it in the present. They may apply it in a new way, but it's a twist on that old meaning. And if you look at what the, the lump of clay analogy means in the Old Testament, it means the opposite of the meaning that the Calvinists attribute to it in Romans 9. So if you look at the only time it's ever flushed out, ever discussed, is Jeremiah 18. And here's what you find. God had made a decree uh, to, to Israel that judgment was coming. He was warning them. You guys are pushing me away with your sin and rebellion. I'm going to give you what you want if you're not careful here, and I'm going to back out. And the minute God backs out, Babylon comes in and is going to ransack them. So he's saying, judgment is coming. And some of the Jews became fatalistic. Oh, God decreed it. Uh, judgment's coming. There's nothing we can do. We're doomed. So God says, no, don't go there. Don't think that. And then he tells Jeremiah to give them this prophecy. He, he, he says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, making a pottery. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. So he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good for the potter to do. Notice this, right from the get-go. The point of the analogy is not the power of the potter to determine what the clay becomes. Rather, it's about the potter's wise flexibility in working with the clay, in responding to what the clay is. 
I've talked to some sculptors who tell me that sculpting is not just about imposing your idea on the clay. You've got to work with the clay because the clay, in a sense, has a mind of its own. Here, the potter was fashioning one kind of a vessel, and the clay wasn't cooperating. It got spoiled. So the potter, being wise and flexible and responsive, he then fashioned a different kind of vessel that now conformed to the kind of clay he was working with. It's about the flexibility of the potter and the wisdom of the potter. And then the Lord says this to Israel. He says, so, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, says the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time, I mean, notice here, your clay in my hand, he doesn't say, therefore, I can make, you, make out of you anything I want. If I want to make you damnable vessels of wrath, I can do that. No, but look at what he says. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or kingdom, any time, which means every prophecy God gives is subject to this condition. If at any time I declare about a nation or kingdom that I will pluck it up and tear it down and destroy it, judgment is coming. If that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil that I intended to do to it. Now, the word evil there in Hebrew is the word ra, and it doesn't mean moral evil. God never does moral evil. But he was planning on leaving them, and that would bring distress and judgment. That's what that word evil can mean, distress or, or tribulation. He's fashioning tribulation against them. But if you will turn, I will turn. Why? Because I'm the potter, and you're the clay, and I can do anything I want, so I can change my mind whenever I want. So just because I said it's going to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. No, the reason I said it, it was going to happen was so it wouldn't happen. I told you judgment's coming so that you'd repent so judgment wouldn't come. Uh, this isn't a deterministic thing. Don't go fatalistic on me here. No, I'm flexible. I'm responsive. I'll, I, I'll, I'll fashion you according to the kind of clay you are, and I just want you to be pliable clay. So don't be stubborn because then I'll have to keep on fashioning this in the direction of judgment. No, turn and I'll turn. Change your mind. I'll change my mind. The future's not faded for you. No, it's open. I'm flexible with this. Respond to me. And then he ends by saying this. The Israelites... Behold, I am shaping distress, evil against you, and devising a plan against you. There's judgment coming. That's why I told you this. So return, every one of you, from his evil way and amend your ways and your doings, so this judgment will not come. You see, guys, the point of the potter clay analogy isn't, oh, I can do whatever I want on the potter. You are saved. You're going to hell. No. It's, it, he's fashioning this. He wants to form vessels of mercy, but if it gets spoiled, he's got no choice but to fashion uh, hard in a direction of judgment. But even that he does for the ultimate purpose of teaching us so that we'll come back to him. But he has no choice but to go in that direction. And so if someone's finding themselves going in that direction, as the Jews were at this time, it's not because God wants them to go in that direction. It's just because he's a wise potter who always responds appropriately to the clay that he has. The point of the potter clay analogy is not about how God determines everything. It's about how God doesn't determine everything, but how God is flexible and responsive and infinitely wise in the way that he deals with human beings. And Paul is telling the Jews this here. Because he's saying God has mercy on whomever he wants and God hardens whomever he wants. But that's not a unilateral thing where God just determines out of one lump, oh, I'm going to have these guys have mercy and I'm going to have these guys hardened. Rather, what he's saying is God has mercy on whomever he wants and the ones he wants to have mercy on are those who will simply have faith. They're the true Israelites. And again, the ones that God will harden are those who won't have faith. That's why Paul always says you are, you are, you are hardened because of your unbelief. And that's surprising to the Jews because they think it was all based on ethnicity or the law. We keep, we're, we're Jews and we keep the law. And Paul's saying, no, God doesn't, doesn't owe you anything for that. No, he, 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 all he's looking for is heart trust, the faith of Abraham, like the Gentiles have. And if you will just turn now, you're in the process of being hardened, and you can't say to him, why have you made me thus? Because you know that he's infinitely wise, so if he's hardening you, it's your own fault. You won't believe, but if you'll just turn to him, he'll fashion you into a vessel of mercy, just as he's doing with the Gentiles. He's a flexible God, a responsive God, not a coercive God. And see, that looks exactly like the kind of God that's revealed in Jesus Christ. Now you can be to see how Romans 9 actually points to uh, the revelation of God in Christ. So the bottom line, folks, is this. God is not this coercive deity, this puppeteer deity, this, this clay-making deity who makes us little gumbies who just have to say and do everything that he determines to be done. He's certainly not the God who causes people to not believe, causes people to be rebellious, causes people to go crazy, causes people to commit murder. He's not the God who's be causing, shaping the disasters and the earthquakes and the mudslides and the child kidnappings and the disease and the rapings and the pillagings and the holocaust and the genocides and all the rest. God doesn't do that kind of stuff. The devil does that kind of stuff. Humans do that kind of stuff. But God always looks like Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Uh, he, he's always the God who's on the side of life. He comes that we might have life and have it abundantly. He comes uh, to, to, to express his character, which is always about washing the feet of disciples he knows will betray him, coming under us to, 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 to breathe life into us, sacrificing himself for us. And his power always looks like the cross. It, 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 his essence is the cross, so everything God does is expresses that. And so the way he rules is not by this Zeus power, but by the power of Calvary. And the way that he governs is by the power of Calvary. And the way that he wins the world is by the power of Calvary. And the way he transforms us is by the beauty of the power of Calvary. And the way that he defeats the devil and defeats all evil eventually is through the beautiful power of Calvary. It's the opposite of the kind of power we've always attributed to the gods. No, this is a God who surprises everybody by showing up as the crucified Messiah. And he wins us by the beauty of his love, saying, come to me. His hands are outstretched even right now. If you're here and you're not a believer, you haven't surrendered to him, you got to know that his hands are outstretched towards you and he's saying, come to me, return to me. I, I, I created you for this pers- purpose. I want to make you a vessel of mercy, uh, not a vessel of destruction. Turn to me, put your trust in me, and let's start this relationship. And what it means for us, folks, is that there isn't a person who's going to hear this message this weekend or a person who's ever been born that was born faded. Yeah, there's a lot of things about us that we don't choose, obviously. Most things about us we don't choose. But that doesn't mean that we're fated, certainly not in our eternal destiny. Uh, I have met so many people who think they are fated. It, it, fatalism is, I think, one of the worst demonic diseases that's ever infected the human mind. And you find it throughout world religions, throughout history. And it was a tragedy when it infected Christianity. Because fatalism completely dehumanizes us. Now we are just puppets. There's nothing we can do about it. Okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. T- totally disempowers us to maybe decision makers, which is the whole point of, of things. And people, they maybe lose their child or they lose a loved one or they get in a car wreck and are crippled or some tragedy happens and they think God has it in for them. I've heard that so God, I'm not one of the special ones. I'm not one of the chosen ones. I'm, I, I'm just, it, he, nothing I do about it, he's just faded me. He's, I'm going to hell. I'm just, he, 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 God hates me. It's a lie, a lie out of the pit of hell, and I rebuke it in Jesus' name. It is a lie, complete lie. It's a lie, as is every variation of it. Like, I can't help it. This is just who I am. It's my genes. It's my parents. It's my grandparents. It was this or that or the other thing. We just give up our say-so on stuff. Lies out of the pit of hell. That stuff can influence us, but it doesn't determine us. Look, at life can throw a lot of crap your way. The devil throws a lot of crap your way. People can throw a lot of crap your way. We live in a war zone, and, and it's, it's, it can be brutal, and it can be tragic, and it can be sad. And, but don't draw any conclusions about God's character on the basis of that. See, fatalism mixes all the, 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 the crap of the world up with God's character. So he becomes the creator of crap. I'm using that word too much in, in the sermon. But <laughs> he, 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 he's behind the whole thing. And how do you trust a God who does that? You know, who damns your own kids arbitrarily before they're ever born. It undermines our trust in God. No, no, if you want to know what God is like, don't look at the world. Don't look at what your parents did. Don't look at your genes. Don't look at anything other than Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what God thinks about you. That's what God thinks about you. And his hands are outstretched on the cross. And they're all stressed to you right now. I don't care what you've done, who you've murdered, who you've gossiped about, who you cheated on. I don't care what you've done, no if, ands, or buts. His hands are outstretched to you. And if you will simply... Turn to him uh, and, and, and admit that, that you need him. Then his death is for you. He's, it's already for you, but now he'll be applied to you. You change and you change. If you turn towards him, you change everything. You are not fated to go down this road that you think you're fated to go down. No, no, no. God, God created us, not robots. He created us to be kings and queens. Uh, if, if that's what he wants to fashion out of us. He created us with freedom and he created us with creativity and he created us with imagination. And he loves that. He, he, he loves it when, one of the things I liked about the Adjustment Bureau is that God likes risk takers, people who think outside the box, who, who, who are willing to go and do radical things. Even sometimes we do it kind of stupidly. He admires the fact that we don't just sit in the middle of the road and play it safe all the time. No, God creates a risky world where there's some things that are really at stake in what we do, but he wants us, us to choose, so it's meaningful that we choose to use our freedom and our creativity and our imagination to bring it into line with his will. And now we become the Adjustment Bureau, praise God. Uh, We become the way that that we steer God's will here on earth uh, as is in heaven. He he made us little versions of himself in a sense. We're made in the image of God. And so we partner with him. We're co-workers, the Bible says, to bring about his will on earth as it is in heaven. He wants to use us if we'll just be pliable, be pliable clay in his hands. And that doesn't mean he takes away our individuality. It means he he enhances our individuality. Because now he'll use our individual uniqueness in a beautiful way that will show forth his mercy. 
to bring goodness in a world where there's so much that's bad and bring beauty into a world that is sometimes so very, very ugly and to be a, bring a glorious dream into a world that's to a large degree a nightmare and, and to, bring, to bring the glory of God into a world that's in many ways just demonic, to bring light where there's darkness and hope where there's despair and peace where there's violence because the violence is everywhere. And he wants to use us, the true Israel, all who simply trust in him to do that. Our job is to be pliable. And know that. Amen. Trust the character of the God who wants to shape us into something beautiful. And the most beautiful thing is that this potter is so wise. He's not into a power game. Oh, look what I can do. No, he's wise in what he shapes. And if we will just yield it to him, every single thing that we have done, he sometimes, he can fashion something beautiful out of it. Even the worst of things, that, 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 that things that should never have happened, done to us or that we did. He fashions it. He, he makes beauty out of dust, we sometimes sing. He makes something glorious out of something that's ignoble, something beautiful out of something that's profoundly ugly, something victorious out of, out of, out of our most loser aspects of, of ourself, something redemptive out of something that seems so damnable. If we surrender to him, become clean in his hands, and we let him mold us and make us, and now we're being vessels of mercy. All it takes is saying, yes, I surrender. Stop trying to mold your own life, do your own thing, call your own shots. Surrender to him and watch him begin his beautiful artistic work. Read rightly, this Romans 9 is a portrait of a beautiful, masterful sculptor whose character is altogether lovely and beautiful and wants to fashion altogether lovely, beautiful things. Read wrongly, it becomes a picture of, uh, that I think is just ugly, terrifying, and even monstrous and can very easily undermine a person's trust in, in, in the Creator. So important to read it with a view on Christ, read everything in, in context, uh, read, look for the summaries that are there. And uh, when there's Old Testament analogies, look at what they mean. Don't assume you know what it means. Investigate it. Read into it. Praise God. Can we be a people who trust in God's beautiful character as we leave here and be pliable in his hands to be used by him to bring his kingdom in this world? Amen. Uh, would you stand? I want to close in prayer. And I ask the prayer teams to come up here. If you have any need whatsoever that could use prayer, and pretty much every need you have could use prayer, so why not come up here? Uh, come, come and pray with these folks. Or if you're here this morning and, and you are not surrendered to Christ, but you want to be, uh, maybe for the first time you heard a God who's worth surrendering to, uh, come up here and just talk to these folks, and they'd like to get you started on, on the kingdom walk. Abba, fathers, we leave this place. I pray we do it as a people who trust in your beautiful characters revealed on the cross. Give us eyes to see how all scripture points to you and the beauty of your self-sacrificial love on the cross. And as we leave here, Holy Spirit, will you uh, make us pliable in the, in the hands of the Holy Spirit to be increasingly made, every day made, into the image of Jesus Christ. And use even our failures, even our struggles, even our falling down as material out of which you're going to show your beauty and your mercy. We pledge ourselves to you as vessels of mercy in Jesus' name. And all of the vessels of mercy said, amen. God bless you guys. Go out and love on the world.